for the first time in a generation, there's the risk of war with Russia. The direct land and property needs of the forces and the spin-offs for the private sector could be significant in the northern office and warehouse sectors. As international tensions mount, how will it play out? I'm David Tame, Analysis Editor at Place North. In today's Place podcast, we'll ask what a surge in defence spending means for the North's property business. We'll also be taking a look at the latest Freeport investment figures and hearing that Liverpool City Council is beginning to deal with the city's stall development sites. The Danish Defence Minister says we're between three and five years out from a Russian attack on NATO. Top generals, presumably with a nod from the government, are talking up the chances of conscription. And Putin, having probably finished off his only serious rival in an Arctic Circle penal colony, looks as mad as ever. Not happy times. This looks like the cue for a timely surge in defence spending, and with it a raft of spin-offs for the regional economy. The property business, a major consumer of ex-Ministry of Defence land, and a potential provider of new facilities for the armed forces and their suppliers, will be in the front line. So how will it play out? First, the context. The Ministry of Defence has an annual budget of £53 billion. This will probably rise. Rishi Sunak says he wants UK defence spending to grow from about 2% of GDP to 2.5%, but he hasn't said when. And we don't know what Keir Starmer thinks, so hold your breath. In the meantime, the numbers are already growing modestly. Last year's spring budget took the top-ups to £5.8 billion in the current financial year, although adjustments for inflation take that down again to £1.1 billion. And all of that is for buying big-ticket items, guns, boats, planes. Spending on actual day-to-day defence stuff is still falling. Now, the North gets a fair chunk of this spending. For its size, the North East does well from defence budget. Gets about £6 per head of population, way above London and the South East. This compares to a pound a head in Yorkshire and the same in the North West, all of which is a little below London and the South East. The imbalance tips the other way if you look at the jobs figures. On this measure, the North West is the winner, with 590 direct MOD linked jobs per 100,000 employed. Yorkshire's number is 120 and the North East is 100. But all northern regions are also rounds compared with the huge concentration of military jobs in the southeast, home of the army, and the southwest, home of the navy. Recently announced investment in our regions include an 807,000 square foot distribution centre in Cumbria for the Ministry of Defence, that's due for completion in October, and a £5 billion national cyber force digital warfare centre in South Ribble, Lancashire. Now, that could be a really substantial piece of property, 200,000 square feet or more. We don't get that. There are also indirect jobs to take into account. That means MOD contractors and so on. And this is where property people need to pay attention. That's because whilst the big growth area is aircraft and spacecraft jobs, up 27% last year, that entire sector doesn't really amount to much, uh, about 1,000 MOD-related jobs all told. Developers may be surprised to know that by far the largest spin-offs are office jobs. About half of the 79,000 indirect jobs we're talking about. So it's a good bet that this is where the most and fastest growth will be found if defence spending shoots up. What about MOD land sales? Surplus MOD land has been a substantial source of plots for house builders and if it's near ports and motorways for industrial developers does a rise in MOD activity mean there'll be less sell-offs or more as the UK defence business focuses on its urgent new priorities? The recent trend has clearly been to sell off land. The MOD shared 1,400 acres in 21-22 and another 480 acres in 2022-23. Current projects include at RAF Sealand on Deeside, where commercial development projects are at work on a 493,000 square foot warehouse, part of a 2.4 million square foot master plan. So this is big business. Now there's more of it to come. The current policy direction points firmly towards yet more sell-offs, lots of them. The Government Property Agency has a work stream called Defence Estates Optimization, which means spending about £4 billion on rejigging what goes where in the hopes of cutting the defence estate by 16% in 
by 2040-41. That implies offloading 54 million square feet of floor space and who knows how much land. One might reasonably ask if this is a target that will survive the first whiff of cordite. Most of the land the MAD has offloaded is described in official paperwork as training areas and ranges. So that means army stuff. Now, if the army stops shrinking, then presumably they won't want or need to sell off so much land. Plus, of course, there's all this talk of conscription, talk boosted by input from no lesser person than the chief of the general staff. That's the top person. Presumably, Secretary of State Grant's Shapps knew he was going to say this, and it's not idle chatter. It's something to take seriously. But expansion of the armed forces isn't happening yet. Expansion of the army in particular. In January 2023, the army totals 75,710 service personnel. That's down 2.2% compared with last year. And it's heading towards a target of 72,500 by 2025. If the army grows, then the likely total would be close to 82,000, a number reached by a National Security Review in 2015. So far, Despite generals dropping alarming hints, the invasion of Ukraine and escalating tensions haven't changed official thinking. Growing the army reserve from 31,000, which is about where it is today, to something approaching 100,000 is already being talked about in as a little bit more likely. But that too will need planned. Everything's a bit hazy and it's difficult to draw conclusions, but a few hesitant outlines are visible to the fog of war. First, Looking at the National Cyber Security Centre plan and the employment statistics, it feels like the office market will probably be a significant growth area if MOD spending increases. Warehousing is also worth watching. Second, the impulse to sell off surplus land was already coming under political pressure long before Putin and Ukraine raised their head. Uh, think of the 1996 sale of service housing, an absolutely cataclysmic disaster which has cost the Ministry of Defence about £4 billion. Now, the Ministry of Defence faces even more hurdles than their already a rather iffy record. So, might we see a cooler approach to land sales in the next few years? Hmm, question mark. The MOD is a policy to execution black hole. So, what comes out of the end of this process is anyone's guess. Meantime, don't have nightmares. And now your weekly rundown of what's going up and what is heading the other way in the place north. Elevator. Doors closing, going down. <laughs> Encouraging news from Liverpool, where the City Council is trying to buy one of the city's several store development schemes. The new Chinatown Resi Offices and Leisure Development at Great George Street was launched in 2015 and has limped along ever since. The original plan was for 800 apartments, a hotel, and 120,000 square feet of offices. That's since shrunk to 446 apartments and 100,000 square feet of offices. Various changes of developer have enlivened the last nine years. Substantial work on site has not. The City Council hasn't got this in the bag yet. Uh, Asker Group, which owns debt on part of the site, is also interested. Even so, this is an interesting change of pace in a council which as readers of Place Northwest's Below the Line comments will know, has enjoyed mixed reviews in the property business. Does this mean the council has got the message? It'll be interesting to see what comes next. A discreet data drop from the government gives an update on investment so far in the North's three functioning free ports. The Humber free port has attracted £516 million in overseas investment, Liverpool, just 22 million from overseas. But the big winner is Teesside, which skipped 500 million domestic investment plus 602 million from overseas. The government reckons this amounts over the next 20 years to 717 new jobs at the Humber Freeport and a whopping 2,150 at Teesside. Alas, nothingness in Liverpool. You can take these numbers with a pinch of salt, but they're useful indicators of trends. Amazing progress, particularly since Humber only launched in July 2023, and the others aren't much older. What we don't know, however, is how far Freeport incentives made a difference to investors' decision-making. But for now, 
three cheers. So that's it for this week. We've seen how Vladimir Putin could change armed forces, land and property needs in the north, taken a look at the latest Freeport investment numbers, and heard how Liverpool City Council is beginning to tackle a legacy of stalled development sites. For more about the built environment in the north, visit placenorth.co.uk. I'm David Tain, and thank you for listening.